thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, today we have the privilege, and I have the privilege, to moderate a session that will be quite exceptional. Why is that? Because we wanted to have on scene today all the decision makers that are having a stance on the new energy landscape, which means a representative of the ministry, a representative of the European Commission for Energy, a representative of the European Parliament. And it's so important because earlier we had so many discussion around the place of regulation and how to move forward, especially in Europe. And lastly, we wanted innovation to be part of it because all this innovation summit is around innovation. So that's the discussion we'll have today. Hence, it's my pleasure to welcome our different panelists today. So we start with uh, um, Christina Peretiakou, which is our State Secretary for International Relations, Energy Digitalization of Moldova. Please. <laughs> Second, I would like to uh, call Christoph Gutler, who is a member of the European Parliament. Uh, then I would like to call Metzild Vosbrofer, which is Director General for uh, General Energy European Commission. <laughs> and lastly, Diego, please. Diego Pavia, who is the CEO of Kik Inno Energy. <laughs> well, you see, this tremendous panel will talk today about uh, the energy transition we will have a lively discussion. Basically, we want to have open discussion on how to frame you know, all the challenges that we're seeing today in Europe to come a step further in the new energy transition. Ah, no, I don't so basically, I would like to start first with a quick questions to all of you, if you allow me. And my first question would be around all the challenges that we're seeing today. Decarbonization, prices mitigation, energy securities. Lots of challenges ahead. Well, is it all the challenges? Do you see other things going on? And where is Europe in regards to all the challenges ahead? Who do you want to start? Well, probably I should start, although the Republic of Moldova is not a part of Europe yet. But I think there are many challenges, and as you, the countries in Europe or European Union is not a homogeneous union because there are different countries, there are different nations, cultures, economies, and uh, the challenges that stay ahead, they very much depend on uh, how the countries could manage the just transition, for example, to, to energy. We all understand that uh, we need to move to net zero transition, but um, how we do it, um, we are still at the stage where we don't have an answer or a scenario that will work for everyone the same way. So I think uh, in, terms of, in terms of legislation, uh, EU uh, still has some work to do. And um, I just uh, probably would like to, uh, to ask my colleagues to, to be more specific about it, because then I can speak about what Moldova is going through. Thank you very much. Uh, then maybe you, you, you're right, decarbonization, uh, price mitigation and energy security are key challenges for Europe. But maybe I can add a, fo a fourth one, it is uh, strategic autonomy. It's a, a little bit linked to uh, energy security, uh, of course, uh, but uh, strategic autonomy is a main concept that we develop after the different uh, crisis we have during this um, mandate at the European Union level. Uh, you know that we have COVID crisis, we have a war in Ukraine, uh, energy crisis, and uh, uh, all this lead to uh, strategic autonomy for energy. Because before the crisis, Europe was importing 64% uh, of its energy. And uh, we know that when we are going to decarbonization, uh, when, when you have a wind turbine, for example, uh, it's good for decarbonization, but it's, it's also good for strategic autonomy, for example. So maybe later on I will question you about strategic autonomy in Green Deal, because 
Mr. Gruntler has been extremely instrumental in the Green Deal that you are talking around. So it would be interesting to see later on how you see that combination together. Yeah, it's clear that with the Green Deal, uh, we have uh, 75 different texts that we have voted in the 75. European Parliament. 75. 75, it's incredible. But now the time is to implement it, huh? yes. of course, uh, with the help of the Commission, because we are waiting for some delegated act, uh, uh, some different texts in order to implement the, the, the best as possible. Uh, all the text of the Green Deal. It means that for decarbonization, we are in a good way. We have goals for 2030. We have now new goals for 2040. Uh, it's, 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 I think, in, in a good way. Uh, maybe for strategic autonomy, we need to make some more efforts in order to convince all the member states that it's not only the price that is leading the market, the, the, the Europe, I can say, because uh, if we want to be strong in the future, we need to support all our companies, all our industries, who are able to produce clean uh, energy. Uh, and maybe it's, it can be a goal for the next mandate. Good subway for Merchold. Yeah, thank you very much. I think Europe has decided to become climate neutral by 2050. This is now a law, and all the EU 20 members, 27 member states have agreed. So what? happened in the energy crisis, in the unprecedented energy crisis in 22, following uh, the invasion in, in Ukraine, we saw a lot of concerns around security of supply. And that, I think, together with the 27 EU member states, we at least managed to go out and come out of the crisis without any major blackouts, without any major disruption. Of course, we saw very high energy prices, and we are still working, and that covers your second point. Security and affordability goes hand in hand, but also our sustainability, our climate goals. So I think what we learned from the crisis is that all three goals need to go hand in hand, and I would join uh, Mr. Krudler saying this is also part of a broader picture of, uh, of security, of geopolitical security, uh, economic security. We have done all the negotiations last year in energy, climate, environment. So we have a framework for 2030 where we put a lot of priority on renewables, on energy efficiency first, which is a key issue for all of us, and it contributes to security, it contributes to affordability and sustainability. And then we have also a number of other legislation to make that 2030 framework predictable. We need a lot of investments, also from companies, and we need to implement it together with the EU member states. By the way, it sounds simple when you say that, but again, EU Green Deal repowering was a huge legislation. It would be interesting for all of us, we are in a small room, right? If you can tell us this kind of negotiation, how that happened, because 27 member states, how is this happening? Was it difficult to reach some of those uh, ambitions? Do you see some roadblocks ahead? Yeah. You know, how do you see that? Absolutely. No, the role of the Commission is to make the proposal. We have the right of initiative. So we are doing studies, impact assessment. We prepare it together with the sector. It's not that we sit in our box or in our office. So we prepare the proposals uh, in two years or two years ago for what we call Fit for 55, so all the legislation in energy and climate for 2030. And then there is a phase of negotiation with the 27 EU member states. They have the presidency and the rotating presidency and the European Parliament. And what happened last year, in most of those, we concluded. So the negotiation between the European Parliament and the Council, the member states, mm -hmm. came to an agreement which is now being published uh, in the official journal, so it becomes law. And now the member states have roughly two years, 24 months, to implement it. And as you say, there is the 2030 targets for energy efficiency, how to reduce, become more efficient. There are ta new targets for, for uh, uh, renewables, which remain a priority. There are targets to become uh, decarbonized in gases, for new hydrogen to develop, uh, and so on. And all that together we need to implement in the next couple of years. It's a lot of detailed work, but it gives this investor security, which we need in order to become climate neutral by 2050. What we need to do, 
now in that case by 2030. 2030 is tomorrow. We need huge amount of investments. And then the, the pathway is already designed for 2040, 2050. But the most urgent need is now to implement what has been agreed. And there, I mean, we, the Commission, will help the member states, will help the stakeholders uh, together with Parliament and, and member states. So time for legislation, time for action. Now action, we are in exactly. this part. Absolutely. Maybe Diego? Yes, I would like to address the opportunity and the challenge. So far, we have been talking about the demand side. So we are creating a tremendous uh, demand side in, in Europe with a single market in with those objectives. But then we should not only look at this, we should look at who is going to supply the PV panels, the offshore winds, the onshore winds, <coughs> the electrolyzers, the batteries, the EVs. And maybe it has been a bit unnoticed, but uh, last the spring and then in the, in the uh, Christmas, both the parliament and the member states are approved. Uh, an acronym is called Net Zero Industrial Act. What does it mean? That by 2030, all those deployments that Mertil and uh, the parliament uh, member is describing has to be supplied 40% by domestic European supply. That's a, that's a tremendous business opportunity in the trillions, in the around eight to nine million new jobs. So let's not uh, forget about this side of the supply side because it's tremendous for the long-term stability and economic growth of Europe. And I will make a second message I made when is in the past our security was hampered because the fuel was provided and supplied by somewhere else. The fuel of the future is going to be the clean tech products. Hmm. Who is going to be supplying the PVs, uh, the, uh, the wind turbines and so on, and whether those are fully masterable by us. You may have heard that uh, one month ago, the Department of Defense has obliged Duke Energy to dismantle CATL storage boxes on concerns of cybersecurity. So today we are ramping down in our green deal, green industrial deal, deploying massive number of equipments that uh, they should be controllable. Because mm. otherwise, we are changing unsecurity of supply of the fuels by unsecurity of supply of the products and services that are going to run our energy and industrial system. Well, it's a, it's a very good point because we talked a lot about sovereign security, about security of supply, but I would be keen to know more from your perspective, Mrs. Stats Secretary, because the Ukraine war changed quite dramatically, and especially for Moldavia, numbers of questions arise. So what's your point of view? What has changed since the war? And you're hopeful in the energy security in the future? How do you see this? The war in Ukraine for the Republic of Moldova was the catalyst for change, was a push that we needed for many years, but there was no political will to, to change things. And I'd like to start by saying that in February 2022, actually when the war started, we planned to disconnect our networks, electricity networks from Russian Belarus, and to connect together with Ukraine to end Soria. And what in, uh, let's say, peaceful times, it is a process that lasts 15 years. This lasted, I think, uh, for two months, and no one from the citizens from the Republic of Moldova knew about it. The same year, in June 2022, together with Ukraine, we became candidate countries for EU accession, which is a great step for our countries. And in February 2023, a Ministry of Energy was created in the Republic of Moldova. We did not have a Ministry of Energy at that time. So uh, in the meantime, because we are a country candidate for EU accession, we are working on the transposition of EU key. Without that, we cannot move on. And uh, we have a lot of support from European Union on that part. We are also part of energy communities since 2010, 2010, which is very helpful to us. And we also receive a lot of help from the United States on the security of supply. So practically in these two years, uh, we manage what we haven't managed in uh, 30 years. So we disconnected ourselves from Russian gas. We do not buy Russian gas anymore. We have, uh, as part of the Republic of Moldova, a region called Transnistria that is occupied by Russian forces. And they receive gas for free. 
and we buy electricity from them, so which is cheaper. But this is a political decision because we must support our country, it's still our country, economically. So we still uh, have this, let's say, complicated relationship with, with Transnistria. But in the meantime, because we have a Minister of Energy, we have a National Climate Action Plan, we have a strategy on energy, and we have a clear vision where we would like to be when we are in 2050. So we have ensured the security of supply. We are working a lot of ener on energy efficiency because we are a former Soviet country and our uh, legacy, I mean from the architectural point of view, is very Soviet. So in Moldova, 50% of energy is wasted in the buildings, and this is a huge challenge for us. And 25% is wasted on transport. So we are thinking about how to electrify the transport as well. And the other percentage is wasted in uh, industry and agriculture. But at least uh, as of today, I think this crisis, and I do not want to sound cynical, but this uh, turned to us, for us, into a success story. So because we are practically uh, moving on in the energy sector, and we are moving towards the electrification of the energy sector on long term. Yes, how to transform a very critical situation into an opportunity of transformation like what you're doing in the country, which is impressive because you are tackling all sectors of the economy to go in one direction and be more resilient in the future. But I would like also to give another success story because Diego was a bit humble in his presentation. In reality, you know, Inno Energy is a success story of innovation in Europe. So I think that it would be good to share a little bit what is the success story for Europe and how the Green Deal will help you to deploy even faster. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Gwen. So a couple of data points. Uh, put numbers of what Gwen just said. We have been implementing industrial players at scale in Europe so far for 25 billion euros in doing green steel, green fertilizers, uh, uh, batteries for EVs, blah, blah, blah. And uh, all our portfolio companies, they require 160 billion between now and 2030. And all of them to be deployed in Europe. That's the size of the baby that we have created. And why? Because regulation is enabling that there is an industry-grown domestic green field in Europe that can thrive without subsidies in the money because the business case fly. But you have to be bold. And uh, because we're greenfield, meaning that we create new objects, then it's easy. But we have also to help the existing traditional businesses to make the transition for a short period of time. And there are here also the TCTF from the Commission has been extremely helpful to give a wind of two, three years where the countries can help the, the, the industries to pivot into the new green industry. But uh, the, the size of the opportunity when is uh, for, again, as I said before, between eight and nine million new jobs by 2030 in Europe, added value jobs. It is what we should be pursuing. We are creating the demand side, let's capture the supply side. So let me be a little bit provocative now, just to, uh, just to balance a little bit. So we said a lot happening in terms of legislation. Now it's all about action. Just looking at the numbers, you know, every day in Europe, we import the equivalent of one billion for imported energy. We talked about sovereignty at the same time. So what can we do to rebalance a little bit and invest much more in the energy transition in Europe rather than importing so much amount of, uh, you know, uh, fuel externally? So can we go faster in electrification, for example? Can we do faster in terms of renewable development? Can we go faster in terms of savings? So at the end of the day, we don't need additional money, but the money that we use for imported, uh, you know, energy, we use it for, you know, the resources in Europe. So, so maybe a quick, maybe I think it's a, 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 quick, a question for a all answer, of you. I think because you will have different, different yeah, perspectives. Uh, very simple. That when I talk to my mother, she's 94. She says, "Hey, Diego, but what are you doing?" Well, I'm working in this, just transformation. And I say, "Mom, we are Spanish. We work any Spaniard. We work until the 12th of March 
to pay the oil and gas import bill. I repeat, any Spanish yeah. uh, works until the 12th of March to pay the oil and gas import. By the way, you burn it and it goes. <laughs> when we electrify our transport, our heating, uh, our industry that is uh, a bit, uh, possible to, uh, to electrify, we'll be working until the 21st of January. So we're for saving 45 days of the wealth that we create year in, year out, to be kept in Europe for Europeans just by electrifying the economy. And the technology is there. Let's not find for the next view, next innovation. We have today the innovation required is about deployment now. So Mitchell, can you, can you do that? Can you make that happen? What we have seen in the energy crisis, and I mean, let's, let's be clear, it was an unprecedented crisis we had never seen in the energy since the 70, 40, uh, 74 when there was the oil crisis. We managed to get rid of Russian gas imports, which were above 40% to roughly 8%. And we want to become completely independent from Russian gas, Russian oil, and from fossil fuel in general. We saw the example of Moldova, what happened there, and I was happy enough to be in Moldova two months ago. It's extremely uh, impressive. A small country who also was very much affected by the crisis, who managed to to change the pattern. I mean, to be electrify, to build lines with Romania, to, to uh, build up renewables energy efficiency, because it's still, it's still a way to go. But the last two years had been extremely impressive work in Moldova, but also in our EU member states together. I mean, and now the next step is that we need to accelerate. And here I agree. First of all, we have the framework. We have the 2030 framework, so we need to deliver and act on it. We have to use the technologies we have better, maybe with digitalization, smarter, and all that. And we have to accelerate and look, look at obstacles. What we did, for example, at EU level with the member states, is to look at the permitting procedures, either for renewables projects, for infrastructure projects. It's still one of the major obstacles. It takes too long to build a wind farm, to build a grid, and so on. We have some elements and some good practice for member states to do it faster. I mean, the balance is always with the environment to, to be obviously considered, but still there are ways to do it faster and cut out steps and build more capacity. And there we have also introduced, and we see first signs. Last year was the biggest record year for renewables in Europe. We had 46% more solar and wind. So we, out of the crisis, and I, I, I agree with what I said, there is an opportunity. There is, so we have to use it. We have to accelerate. We have to use our own EU industry. The Net Zero Industry Act and Critical Minerals Act are there to really deploy more of the EU. But we, we can accelerate, but we need still imports. I mean, in the car sector, we still are highly dependent on oil, and we are still dependent for the heating sector. So it will take time, but we need to do everything to, to speed it up. Mr. Gunther, can I ask your opinion on electrification, how to go faster? What's your opinion? It's clear. That for me, the main goal is to double the electricity production in Europe. Uh, because when, if you succeed in, the, in that way, uh, it will be very easy for the imports. It will be a third of the imports that we had. Because never forget that uh, uh, if you need, for example, three terawatt ter of uh, oil, gas, etc., coming from outside Europe, three terawatt of oil means one terawatt of electricity, because it's more there is more efficiency yeah. in, in that way. That the reason why we need first to double the production. The second, uh, of course, we need some more tools in order to have a real mm. goal uh, uh, on it, uh, and. The, with that, it will be after easier to, to find solution to have the, the cheapest price as possible. You talk, you talk uh, about it. I just want to add that we are in strong solidarity with Moldova. Uh, and uh, it's clear for energy especially uh, that uh, we have uh, some different tools uh, like uh, uh, European uh, facility, uh, con connecting facility, in order maybe to help our grids to to work together, things like that, uh, as it is with, with uh, U Ukraine. Uh, we need uh, to, to reform the energy electricity market design, 
uh, it arrives uh, next week to, to the Parliament to, to vote for the final agreement, and we, we, we find a good solution. It's very important to say it because it, all over Europe, people say, oh, EMD, it's not good, uh, you have to go out of EMD. It's crucial for Europe to be in a solidarity about electricity. It's crucial also for France here in order to find ways to export to other countries in Europe the production and also to import in other parts of the, of the day or of the weeks. Uh, and uh, with the tools we, we put inside, PPA, CFD, etc., you have the possibility to have long-term agreement uh, in order not to depend on uh, uh, coal uh, plant in, in Poland, for example, one day. Uh, it will be very good for the, for the price. And the other idea about the price is the price of hydrogen. Uh, it's very important uh, to, 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 to help the market starting. And here we have the hydrogen bank. Uh, we will maybe have four billion uh, of possibility to help each kilo of production uh, in order to have the same level of price for this decarbonized hydrogen uh, as uh, the grey hydrogen coming from, from natural gas. I think it's, very, it's a very good tool. Uh, maybe to, to, to finish, uh, we have a very important report to talk about it. It is Net Zero Industry Act. Mm -hmm. uh, when we, we have here all the technology, clean technology for energy, for transports in Europe, all is inside. All can be strategic if a country wants to, to have it strategic. Uh, the, we have also permitting uh, with, uh, with uh, industrial voile. We have also, very important for me, uh, um, a kind of by European act can say that we ah. need to support our European industry and companies. Uh, it's, it's a goal, a very important goal for me. And we have a fight uh, with the Council, uh, I must admit, because uh, we succeed to put in the text 30% of European preference for the public procurement for auctions. Uh, 30%, well, it's a beginning, it's good. Uh, but what I want was to have a trajectory to finish in 2035 with the 100%. Uh, it's a preference, it, it, it's not an obligation. You, you look to the proposal, and if it's not in a good way, you can choose Chinese or whatever you want. But first, you have to, to, to look uh, about the proposition of a European company with a resilience criteria. Uh, and uh, the Council don't want any trajectory. That's the reason why when the regulation will arrive uh, next year, uh, okay, we just have 30%. And I think also that for the new mandate, it will be very important to continue to fight, to have this uh, preference. Sometimes it's a gros mot, as we say in French, but it's very important. Americans did it, Chinese did it. They promote their own factories and uh, companies, and we are unable to do it in Europe. Then we have to, 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 to fight on it. And of course, this will be a part of an industrial deal that. Uh, I try to push uh, with uh, Commissioner Breton especially, but also with DG NR, uh, in order for the new mandate. The, the, this mandate was the Green Deal mandate. Yeah. We have 75 texts, as I say. It continues to 2050. But now we can try for the five new years to have a real project for the industry in Europe. It can be named the Industrial Deal, Pact Industrial, uh, and, of course, with money. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you talk about it, and I will finish, because I don't want to be too long. But uh, money is also crucial, and we have not enough money. And uh, we need to find own resources. We need a sovereignty fund in order to help all those net uh, technology, uh, because today it's not enough. Uh, in front of us, we have the, Amer uh, the United States of America, with uh, 400 billion uh, uh, dollars of supports to their own uh, industry. And in the other uh, side, we have no, not enough money. Then we have to, to push for it for the next MFF especially. 
So you made extremely important points, huh? extremely important, because in the past years, we were very much you know, focused on US for US, China for China. And where is Europe? It's a bit squeezed. So how to regain hope in Europe for the industry? We have the biggest players. Look at the wind industry. Biggest players are in Europe. Look at energy efficiency. Biggest players are in Europe. So I mean, there is room, and we need to defend Europe. We need to give hope for Europe. It's not only the other geographies, but there is a good business case for Europe. So we count on you, and we hope that the new legislation will even fight us stronger for the industrial deal as the next step. That's a tremendous objective, so thank you for raising it. This is critical. Back to you, Mrs. Mrs. State Secretary. I have one question uh, that is tremendously important because we talked a lot about energy market design, we talked a lot about you know, uh, the renewable energy, but then the grid, you mentioned it. The grid is so critical. And so for you in Moldavia, it's a lot of investments for grid modernization, energy availability at the end. How do you track investments? How do you make that happen? Well, in Moldova, there are so many problems, but we need to, first of all, to ensure the smooth transition from gas to renewables. And currently, we are investing a lot in renewables, but on the other hand, we do not have money for storage, so we have here an imbalance. And we do not have money for digitalization, so because digitalization is costly, and I think everyone understands it. And currently, we are trying to find a balance between those things. So um, we need also to focus on um, our infrastructure because it's very outdated and inefficient. So we are now building a high voltage line that will uh, join Romania uh, with uh, Moldova. Uh, we have, uh, just for your information, we have seven electricity lines and only one is uh, uh, in Moldova, all the others, they pass through Transnistria, and whenever Ukraine is bombarded, uh, we have a blackout, or we could have a blackout. So, um, and with digitalization, we just started a project with smart metering to see how it works, because we have also the issue of um, a curve flattening, so our consumption mainly is mainly in the mornings and in the evenings. So uh, let's say our energy mm, transition is on, uh, is on everything now, if I could say so, because the Minister of Energy is new, and we try to do everything that we could not or did not uh, during uh, 30 years. And if we speak about investments, uh, we would like to attract investments by becoming more and more vocal, by having a transparent legislation. And in that sense, by the way, is not because, well, I am proud that today we signed a memorandum of understanding with Schneider Electric yeah. on sandboxes in energy because uh, we understand very well that without innovations in energy, we cannot move forward. And maybe at this point, uh, we do not even see what future innovations in energy would be, because we are very much focused on wind and solar. But I think on long term, there are so many new things to come. And uh, for us, it's very important to have an attractive legislation that uh, would be attractive for international companies and international investors. Uh, and say that, uh, admit the fact that we need, we need help and we are looking for support. This is absolutely clear. And I think, again, you met another important point, which is also about digitalization and how digitalization play a role in your transformation. And I think you made it clear with smart metering. But it's just, yeah, it's just the first step. Um, and. Uh, We'll know this year how, how it works, because we also want to introduce differentiated tariffs. And uh, it's something, uh, well, it's not rocket science, but for Moldova again, because uh, everything in energy in Moldova, by the way, was connected only to Russian gas. And although 60% of the population, they still use the stoves, the wood, to heat themselves during winter, Whenever there is news about uh, Russian or gas in general, we have a scandal. So we want to refocus the attention of people 
on the fact that there is life after gas, or maybe there is life after Russian gas, and innovations and electrification of the energy sector is, is the present and is the future of the energy sector. So I'm glad you said it, because it's all about innovation, and it's all about deploying also the existing technology that we have, so communicating on it. So I would be glad to hear your views, Diego. What do we have today in Europe, and we have to scale? What do we do not have, and we have to invest? Uh, two answers. <laughs> we need to be bolder, because we've got everything that we need. And uh, when any of the NIMBYs, and by the way, the NIMBYs is us, uh, say that, hey, we don't want this overhead uh, uh, grid because it uh, disturbs my, my landscape, sorry, I mean, there, is, there needs to be a solution to, to, the, to the game. But if I can touch again on, on the grid. Last year, 2023, 9.5 billion euros, I'm the numbers guy, of curtailment from the offshore of uh, Germany down to the load of Germany in the south. 9.5 billion. That anyway, that's been paid by the German citizen, because A, it's not the problem of the uh, uh, international guys, it's the problem of there is no grid. 9.5 billion. It's just going to be increasing. The more you will deploy in the zones where there is a wind resource, the more you will create in this. So is there a solution? Yes. We can just shift most of this generation by just deploying decentralized storage in many places of the grid. And you just take the windows that you need for uh, when uh, the generation is not coupled to the demand. So uh, Isuben is thinking differently. Uh, but that's what I'm saying about boldness. Uh, today, uh, the, the future system is decentralized demand, as it was before, but also decentralized generation. Our cars will be generating, will be storing and then generating. We have to think differently. And then intelligence in the grid is uh, to be all over the place, and thus cybersecurity. And I go back to my first message about cybersecurity. The doors to the system are manifold. There are much more in the future. Let's be careful which equipment we deploy mm. so we don't leave uh, back doors to non-friendly players. But that's a very good point, because during the Juncker Commission, there was a lot of attention around prosumer. You produce, you consume. So, Mitchell, I would like to hear your views. Have we done enough in terms of legislation to foster this prosumer approach? Can we do even more? What's your perspective? As we said before, I think on, on the prosumer issue, we have the legislation. We have the renewables directive. We have the energy efficiency. It's now time to deliver and implement and act. So I think we need this commission had the European Green Deal adopted with the help of the parliament and the member states. The next one really has to act on it and implement it. And that means using all the possibilities of the existing legislation. And, and I think we are far away of using what's there for prosumers. It's a good example because there is already a lot we can do putting our solar PV on our balconies, being much more uh, digitalized. I, I very much agree with your point on the need to even go further. We have an uh, action plan for digitalization in the energy sector where we speak about data center, I saw a, a, a big stand there, where we speak about smart grids and smart homes, where we speak about cybersecurity and uh, how to use more efficiently and smarter the grids. So all of those need to follow by action. I think the digitalization of our grids, for example, but also about the system to use it better is certainly something we can act on. And as consumer and prosumer, I think we need probably to educate even better our uh, citizen. I mean, we all have uh, more and more uh, time on our smartphones with apps and so on. I think this is a way we still need to showcase. I was at the Consumer Forum in Dublin in November last year. It was so impressive how many uh, good actions there are in all of our EU member states, some more in the north and the south and the east but it's not so much known. So the role of the commission is now to pass on action, but also to showcase, to exchange, facilitate best practice from companies, from prosumer organization, from others. And I think we, we need to use that time. There is a lot already in the legislation. I don't think we need a lot of, we need sometimes to go and specify in a delegated act uh, more clearly what we want. We have the data center where we 
uh, need to report uh, on the electricity use. So there are elements, but I think furthermore, we really now need to go on actions. So thank you very much. I think we had a very different perspective, very also complementary. At the end, I would retain three points. First one, transform crisis into an opportunity, but opportunity for a huge step down, step up, meaning a radical change and transformation, first thing. Second thing, legislation, from legislation into actions. Now we're talking about actions, showcasing, uh, and making sure that the best practices are well spread across Europe. And third point, from Green Deal to industrial deal. Not that we give up on the Green Deal, but we want more Europe for Europe. These would be the three takeaways, if you agree. Mm -hmm. And now I would like to take five minutes to open the questions to the room because we have tremendous guest speakers. So please don't hesitate if you have questions, we'll take a few of them. Please, over there. Yeah. You can hardly see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hard to see. Hard to see, indeed. Uh, a question to Mr. Grodler. There is uh, the election coming up, and uh, most, many newspapers say that the majority uh, would change, so, or at least will uh, change slightly. So wh what is your view, and what will be the impact on, uh, on the future of energy and climate policy for Europe? Thank you. Uh, First, uh, thank, thank you very much for the question. First, the worst is never sure. Don't forget <laughs> it. And uh, the only uh, fight that we lose, the fight that we are not going on, that's the reason why. Maybe I can add, when there is a will, there is a way. Uh, and uh, we want to succeed in this election. It's not an electoral meeting and that I will be short <laughs> in, the, in this part. Uh, but, but we fully believe, and, and we have to explain it, to all the Europeans, that's uh, what we are doing. It's good for all the Europeans, and uh, we, we need to have a, a, a strong support. All the European parties, uh, pro-European parties, because what we are doing, we, we never done uh, so much uh, on uh, climate uh, uh, on policies, on in the industry. We never talk so much on, on an industry. We are in a good way uh, to find solutions, but we need to have. Uh, um, popular support in order to continue in that way. It's clear. And not one party against another one. Huh? It's all the European parties, because you know that in the European Parliament we have not a majority. Uh, oh, the, the three groups, you can say the, the left, the right, and the center. I'm from the central group, Renew. Uh, all together we are making this, the same policies. We try to find compromise in order to, to push in, in, in a good way. And we try also to have a solidarity between countries. It's very important. It's always a problem for the Commission. But uh, we, we try to have agreement. Uh, uh, Germany and France, but not only Italy, uh, all the smallest countries uh, have to, to have a part of this uh, de de deployment uh, on SMEs, on the di different policies. And uh, if we continue in that way, I think uh, people will con continue to support us on and to find a, a, a real solution for, for their children. Maybe one last question, right here. Sorry, I'm on the wrong. front, please. <laughs> oh, very good. Uh, hello. Um, so, Christoph uh, Gondola uh, referred that um, uh, European or European countries or Europe need to produce the double. Uh, after energy, but that production is nothing without uh, an efficient management and within the countries. So I would like somehow to, to, to comment uh, the constraints that exist on the interconnections between countries. And I may uh, allow me to, to, to refer an example since we have a Spanish person on the panel that we have limitations between Spain and France. And it seems that is not so much in terms of technical limitations, but a decision making. So I would like just to comment. Okay. It's a tricky one. Comment if between I, Spain and France. If I may, we no, are. I'm Portuguese. We are working <laughs> yeah. together with Portugal, Spain, France on electricity interconnection. There is a fund available connecting your facility. There's already one line, which is Biscay Bay, which is running over cost like a lot uh, right now with the inflation. But we are working on it. It's, it's a real issue because uh, Portugal and Spain are not well connected. 
And we need that connection because there's a lot of potential or there's a lot happening in those countries, in particular on renewables, and other countries need it, not so much France, but also it needs to go then to, to Germany and other uh, uh, countries in, 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 in Central Europe or other parts. So we are working with all the players together that this is happening. But if I may, when, in just one second, as a Spanish, I would not mind to keep my electron because they cannot flow it to France as long as I use my electron to do cars and then I export cars. Because again, it's about added oh, value. Hydrogen. It's about added value products. It's not about the, the electron only or the molecule. It's about added value. Just as Spanish. <laughs> uh, just in a short time to, to add that we push clearly for interconnection. Not only electricity, but also steam, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, réseau de chaleur. Uh, 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 yeah. Steam, uh, it, it, well, we understand it, what it is. Steam, steam heat. Pie, uh, heat, heat, maybe, uh, and and uh, we try to to reinforce the cooperation with uh, with Spain especially, and we know that with a new list of uh, peak projects d'intérêt commun, uh, yeah. important uh, project of common interest. Project. Okay, inside we have, uh, for example, Barmar, you yeah. know the connection for Barcelona, hydrogen between Marseille. Barcelona to Marseille. Uh, it's, it's uh, an example, but we try. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we need more that one day to make Chrome. Uh, we not, yeah. we, it's the same for the, the relation between different countries, but we try to promote it. Huh? And, and to double the production, of course, I only talk about production. It's maybe the, the easiest, maybe. Uh, but after, if you have electricity production, you have, of course, a grid. Uh, and usually, when we talk about investment, we think about the production, but we fully uh, forget the, the grid. Uh, we need uh, backbones uh, all around Europe for the solidarity, but we need also microgrids for local uh, investment. Uh, and that's the reason why we need this digitalization. We need cyber security also, because uh, you know that when the war begins in Ukraine, the Russian uh, first attack uh, satellites and things like that, and it stops the wind turbine in, in the Baltic Sea. Uh, that's the reason why we have to, to be very careful about cybersecurity too. But still, at the end of the day, the objective and the message passed by this session is full of hopes and full of ambition for Europe, and that's what we aim at. Thank you very much. We would like a big round of applause for our excellent guest Merci. speakers. Thank you. Thank you.